Well, for most of us, the thought of surgery is daunting enough, especially brain surgery. But just imagine performing that kind of surgery in the line of fire yourself. Facing a constant stream of patients and mortar explosions, neurosurgeon Lee Warren worked around the clock to save the lives of American and Iraqi soldiers, civilians, and even terrorists. As much as he tried to hold it together, pressure and the constant threat of death pushed him to the brink. In his book, No Place to Hide, Dr. Warren shares the trauma of being a surgeon on the front lines and the war he faced within himself. Please welcome to the 700 Club, retired Major Dr. Lee Warren. It's so nice to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. You know, as we look at that, it's almost unimaginable the kind of stress and tension. We're talking about stress on the show today. You're the perfect guest yes. <laughs> to have on for that with all that you've been through. But talk a little bit about where your life was at before you were deployed to Iraq in 2004, because you had some chaos going on in your personal life at that time. I did. Um, I've said that it's, it was sort of like I was at war before I I went to war. I, my, yeah. my marriage had, had long struggled and ultimately ended in divorce. And then um, my brother, who was 43 at the time, had a stroke mm -hmm. and nearly died just a few months before I deployed. And then my grandfather died two weeks before I left for the war. So it, it was really quite a long period of personal struggle up until the point where I actually went to war. What was it like? I mean, just knowing you're being deployed to Iraq under the circumstances that existed there had to be daunting in itself. What was that like for you to go through that kind of stress and trauma? It was difficult and the biggest, I think the hardest thing for me was not knowing what to expect. Really as a, as a neurosurgeon in the United States, we have everything at our fingertips. Exactly. And we didn't have much information about what we were going to face there except that we would be operating in tents, which was pretty daunting. In so. itself daunting, but you didn't have all the things that you needed. You just had to make do with what was available, right? That's right. We had a limited uh, set of resources. We had eight operating tables and four operating rooms and tents to operate in and a limited number of instruments and even blood. Yeah. You, you saw some things that really, I mean, no person should see. A doctor often sees trauma from accidents and things, but you tell the story of Paul Statzer, I believe is how you'd pronounce his last name, and talk a little bit about that because that had to be very traumatic for you as a surgeon. Paul was the worst injured person I'd ever seen that survived. Um, he had uh, uh, basically three or four feet away from an IED uh, when it exploded oh and took most of the left side of his head and neck away. And, and when he arrived at our hospital, he was still alive. But it took four surgeons, uh, myself included, about four hours to just stabilize him enough to get him on the plane back to Germany. Mm. And he did live. He and did. This had to have impact on your personal faith. We just saw the testimony of a man in prison who had been very hardened by a lot of the things that had happened in his life. How did this deployment to Iraq, the things that you saw, the, the turmoil in your own personal life, you know, they say you get bitter or better. How did it affect right. your faith? Well, for me, I was, I was really all about control in my own life. Um, neurosurgeons are sort of known for being <laughs> control freaks. And I, um, even in my faith, I sort of felt like I was in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think when I got to Iraq and the environment was very chaotic and I was not, in fact, in charge of anything, uh, that was a very difficult kind of moment for me. And it began to kind of grind away at what I thought I knew and what I thought that I believed. Um, it really wasn't until I was sort of caught outside in a mortar attack that I really sort of yeah. dealt with God on a ground level and figured out that I was not in charge of anything. And I think although he didn't sort of take everything away magically and make everything okay, he did put me in a place where I understood for the first time that I had no place to hide but him. Mm -hmm. It must have been very hard for you as someone who enjoyed control, and most of us do enjoy some element of, of thinking we have that anyway in our lives, to come home then and experience some PTSD. What was that like for you? Well, it was, the first thing was I sort of felt like I was going crazy because I, as a mental health expert, a neuroscience expert, I figured I wasn't going to be prone to those sorts of things. So I would, mm -hmm. something unexpected would happen, like I would hear a helicopter fly by or, or hear a loud sound. And, I, and emotionally, I would feel just like I was back in Iraq. I, I would expect the patients to come rolling into the ER or something to blow up. Um, but at the same moment, I would know that I was okay. I would know I was in Alabama and everything mm -hmm. was fine. So it was, it was quite disconcerting to have that mental battle raging inside. How did you deal um, with that? 
Um, really at the advice of my wife, uh, after a long period of uh, harassing me, I finally started to write, uh, and sort of start journaling and chronicling things, and ultimately went out and actually opened up the trunks that I brought home, uh, where I saved all these things up from Iraq and never looked at them again or talked about them. And then, so I'm working through the, the mementos from the war and, and some of the shrapnel and things I'd brought home, and then also starting to write, uh, I sort of began to understand how to had a heal from that experience. Yeah. It, well, you really have to face it head on, don't you, to you do. heal from something traumatic that's happened bury to it. you. That's right. Yeah. I think most of us want to just get on with life, forget about it, but in the end, it rears its ugly head again until we do face that's it right. uh, head on and deal with it. Where's your life today? Tell us about where um, you're at now. God's really redeemed me, Terry. Um, I'm married to Lisa now, and we have a beautiful family. Um, we live in Auburn, Alabama, and I practice neurosurgery there and write. Um, I've written my first novel now and oh, we're just doing a lot of a lot of things um, that, that God's allowed us to do and we're deeply involved in our church and, yeah. and uh, how has this tenderized you as a doctor uh, it's changed everything about how I practice um, it's not just about science and, and technical things now it's, yeah. it's really about every patient I encounter is an opportunity to share the grace that I've, that's been given to me and and um, yeah. It's just changed everything. I tell you, this is an important book for all of us to read because it helps you understand what the men and women who serve in difficult places often are called to go through and how uh, difficult the recovery can be. They need friends. They need family. They need support. They need people to encourage them in their faith. The book is called No Place to Hide. It's available wherever books are sold. Thank you, Lee. So great to have you with yeah, us. Thank you, thank you for so your work. Good to be here. God bless you. Mm -hmm. God bless you.